What's going on guys? My name is Matt and I am back with a new PC build. This time the price point is $600 and for that price you're getting some pretty great performance especially taking into consideration the current market. This is going to be a full PC build guide meaning I'm going to show you each of the parts, why I picked them, show you how to put this PC together step by step, show you how to install windows and drivers, and finally show you how the system performs in gaming and in streaming. And just as a teaser for performance, here's the system playing and streaming Warzone to Twitch at 1080p high with well over 60 FPS. But before we get further in the video, here's a word from today's sponsor. Are you tired of that pesky activate windows watermark? Then you can remove it for under $16 thanks to today's sponsor CDK Deal. All you have to do is head to the link in the description, add the Windows 10 key to your card, and when you hit checkout use the code MAT20. Then within seconds of checking out you'll have your key, then you just have to search activation settings, click change product key, enter it in, press next, press activate, and boom you have a fully activated copy of Windows 10. These are legit keys that CDK Deals gets directly from Microsoft and by grabbing a key from them you're directly supporting the channel. So like I said before, this is a $600 gaming PC that offers a great value for that price. I made sure to go with parts that are all high quality, reliable, and a great value. So without further ado, let's go ahead and start talking about the parts in the $600 gaming beast. Normally for this budget, going Ryzen would be a no-brainer, but with current price hikes and stock issues, the best choice actually ended up being an Intel CPU. What I went with is the Intel Core i5-10400F. This is 6 core 12 thread CPU with a base and boost clock of 2.9 and 4.3 GHz respectively. For around $150 this is actually offering a better value than the Ryzen 5 3600 because that CPU is now going for over $200 or more. Now yes this is a locked chip so no overclocking but performance on this guy is great. Also the F in the name means there's no integrated graphics which is fine because this system will be using a dedicated graphics card. One other nice thing about the 10400F is the fact it comes with a free stock cooler in the box. Yes this is the basic Intel stock cooler but it gets the job done and saves us money to to spend in other parts of the build. It's a basic aluminum heatsink and it's kind of ugly but it keeps our CPU temps in check which you'll be able to see in the benchmarks. Moving on to the motherboard I again tried to find the best price to performance part I could. What I went with is the Gigabyte B460M DS3H for around 85 bucks. This is a micro ATX motherboard with 4 DIMM slots, an M.2 slot, plenty of PCIe expansion and a nice neutral color scheme. Going for a B460 board over the more expensive Z490 boards does come with a slight compromise to RAM speed, but in terms of value per dollar this board fits the bill. I've noticed this motherboard goes in and out of stock sometimes, so if this or any other parts go out of stock or have major price changes, I'll leave alternative options in the description. Moving on to RAM, this is an area where not a huge amount of attention need to be paid. What I was looking for was a 16GB kit of RAM with a speed of 2666MHz or higher and decent timings. I ended up getting this 3000MHz kit of Oloy RAM which has 2x8GB sticks for around 75 this is CL16 RAM that offers a great value. 16GB is plenty for modern gaming and is even enough for streaming and 1080p video editing. What's also nice is this kit's only using up half of the RAM slots, meaning upgrading is as simple as popping in two more sticks. For storage, I recommend getting the biggest SSD you can afford now and upgrade mass storage later down the line. For this budget, I was able to squeeze in a crucial P1 500GB SSD for $55 which is a very good price. This is an NVMe SSD which comes in the Ultra M.2 form factor. This means it's about the size of a stick of gum, installs in seconds, and doesn't require extra cables the way regular SATA drives do. One other nice thing is that the Crucial P1 drives have DRAM which is helpful on a boot drive which is what this will be used for. 500GB is a good starting point offering enough storage for your OS, applications, and a modest games library. With this being said, if you're having trouble staying under budget, going for a basic 256GB SATA SSD for around $30 isn't a bad idea because again upgrading mass storage later down the line in the form of a big hard drive is very simple and relatively affordable. Moving on to the graphics card, this is the place where things get a little weird. All the parts featured in this build are new with the exception of the graphics card. If you've tried to purchase a graphics card in the last few months then you know it's very hard to find a good deal even for low 
lower end cards. Because of this, we have to get a little creative. What I went with is an RX 480 4GB, which I got Buy It Now from eBay for $160. Prices are continuously creeping up, so this $160 card was a pretty good deal. This is the MSI Gaming X version of the 480, which has a really beefy cooler and a dual fan design. With that being said, I recommend going for a 4GB RX 480 or 580 and try to keep it under the $180 price point. You can find these on eBay or sites like AliExpress, and I'll link multiple options down below. The RX 480 is getting a bit old at this point, but it's still great for modern 1080p gaming at 60 plus FPS and pretty much anything you throw at it. Ideally, we would have went for something like a 1650 Super or 1660 Super, but the current state of the market kind of forces us to go used if we want to get this PC to the $600 price point. It's really not clear when the GPU shortages and price hikes are going to end, and prices will likely continue to rise over the next few months, so snagging an RX 480 or 580 now may not be a bad idea if you're in desperate need of a graphics card. Moving on to the power supply, I went with the tried and trusted EVGA 450BR. This is a 450 watt 80 plus bronze rated unit that provides plenty of clean power to the entire system. 450 watts may not seem like a lot, but it's more than enough and coming from a reputable manufacturer like EVGA means you can rest assured that this unit should last you and stay functional for a very long time. At a little over $40, this is an amazing value. Sure it is not modular, but it has has all black sleeve cables which isn't something you always see at this price point. Finally let's talk about the case. To keep the budget under the $600 price point I had to find a very inexpensive chassis to hold all of our parts. What I went with is the Matrix 30. This is a case that regularly goes for only $30 which at that price is a great deal. It has a full tempered glass side panel, decent ventilation, and overall a subjectively nice look. This isn't the easiest case to build in, but if you follow along with the guide in this video, then you'll do just fine and we'll be able to put together an ultra clean system with very little cable clutter. Overall, for $600, you're getting a set of parts that are great for gaming and streaming, are reliable, and should last you for a long time to come. Now that you've seen what parts are in the system and understand why I picked them, it's now time to show you how to put everything together step by step, then show you how to install windows and drivers, and finally show you the performance of the system. But before you get building, it's important to have the right tools, which for this build will be a standard Phillips head screwdriver, a smaller Phillips head screwdriver, and possibly a pair of pliers for the motherboard standoffs, which we'll discuss later in the guide. I would recommend using a magnetic screwdriver as it makes building the PC a bit easier in a number of different ways. Once you have all the parts ready, your tools in hand, have an open area to work on, and have a few hours blacked off, then you are ready to start building your PC. Start by getting out your motherboard box, open it up and grab the board itself along with the IO shield. Take the board out of the bag and rest it on top of the box. Next grab out your CPU box, open it up, pull out the internal box and grab out the CPU clamshell. Now on the motherboard, press down and out on this metal retention arm, then flip it over to reveal the socket like this. Get your CPU handling it only by the edges and line the marked corner on the CPU with the marked corner on the motherboard. Once lined up, lower it into place applying no pressure. With it in, flip the cover back over like this, push the metal retention arm back into place making sure it clips in. Also, this cover will pop off, make sure you keep it as if you ever sell or RMA your motherboard in the future you will need this. You can now get out your stock cooler that came in the CPU box. Flipping it over, you can see there's thermal paste pre-applied so there's no reason to add our own. Orient it with the Intel logo face up and lower it down lining up the pegs on the cooler with the holes in the motherboard. Once lowered down, press in these clips going in a cross pattern like this. Make sure they clip in secure. Now take the CPU fan cable and route it to the CPU fan header at the top of the board. Line the notch up in both the connector and the header and press it into place. With that done, your CPU and CPU cooler are successfully installed. You can now get out your two sticks of RAM. Bring your attention to the four RAM slots here on the motherboard. We're going to be installing these in slots 2 and 4 which are the gray ones. Start by opening up the clips on both slots which is 4 in total. Bring your first stick over and line the notch in the stick with the notch in the slot and lower it down. Now press down on each end until you hear a clicking noise and the clip snap shut. Now go ahead and repeat this same process for the second stick. With that done, it's now time to install our SSD. Bring your attention to the M.2 slot under the cooler. Use your smaller screwdriver to remove this little screw right here. Bring your SSD over to the slot and line the notch in the SSD with the notch in the slot. Once you have the orientation figured out, go ahead and insert it into the slot and at an angle. Hinge it down, then reinstall the screw. Now that the SSD has been successfully installed, you can put your board to the side and get out your case box. Open this up and pull the box from the case instead of the case from the box. 
Once out, start by unscrewing the two thumb screws on the back panel, then pull back and lift this panel away. Lay the PC onto its side, remove the four thumb screws on the glass panel, and lift the panel away. You can now put the foam, bag, back panel, and glass panel all in the case box to get them out of the way and protect them while you're building your PC. Now undo and pull out the screw bag here. Because of the motherboard we're using, you need to remove this standoff and move it to the hole right here. I did this with a nut driver, but something like a pair of pliers would work fine. With that done, bring your attention to the PCIe cover area, remove this screw and the panel it holds on, then remove this screw and the corresponding cover. Finally, bend this cover back and forth until it snaps off. Now with the case on its feet, hold on to the front cover at the bottom and pull it off like this, taking the cables out with it. Take all these cables and route them through this hole here, then reinstall the cover by snapping it into place. Now take all those cables and route them down through here like this. Take the HD audio and USB cable that look like this and route them through this hole down here. Now set the case onto its side and get out your I.O. shield. Orient it like this and lower it to the I.O. cutout like this. Press each corner in place which can be annoying to do but just keep at it until all corners are in and it's completely secure. With that done, grab your motherboard, handling it by the cooler and lower it into the case like this, IO first, hanging it down making sure the IO lines up with the IO shield and that you can see the standoffs beneath the motherboard holes. Next get out 6 of the motherboard screws that look like this from the bag that came in the case. Take these one at a time and install them in each of the motherboard holes with a corresponding standoff beneath it. Now that the motherboard is secured down, bring your attention to the two cables you routed earlier. Take the HD audio cable and bring it to the HD audio header. Flip it so the HD audio text is facing down and press it into the header. Now for the USB cable, plug it into one of the two USB headers with the text facing up. If you're unsure about either of these, just look at the pin layout on the connectors and the headers to ensure you're plugging them in the right way. Once they're plugged in, take the excess cable slack and push it to the back of the case so only the small wires are hanging out like this. Now get out your power supply and unbundle the wires. Take your PSU with the fan facing the bottom of the case and insert it like this. Now take the four screws with the power supply and install them in the back of the PSU securing it to the case. But before we route or plug any of these cables in, take the fan cable for the back fan and plug it into the fan header closest to the I.O. the same way that you plugged in the CPU fan. With that done, you can put the case back onto its feet so we can start routing cables. Start by taking the big 24 pin cable that looks like this and push it through this hole here. Take the 8 pin CPU power cable and push it through that same hole. Now take the rest of the cables except for the PCIe power cable that looks like this, bundle them up and re-secure them with the twist tie that originally held the cables bundled together. Now at the back of the case, take all the little front panel I.O. cables that look like this and push them through this hole here. Take the USB 3 cable that looks like this and push it through the hole that's right above that. Now take the 24 pin cable and push it through the hole above that. Now take the 8 pin CPU cable and push it through that same hole but we will discuss an alternative routing path in a minute. Put the case onto its side so we can start plugging things in. Grab the big 24 pin cable and bring it to the 24 pin header on the right side of the motherboard. Line the clip on the connector with the bump out on the header and lower it down. Once lowered down, you can press it in until the clip snaps into place. Now directly below that, take the USB 3 cable and line the bump out on the cable with the notch in the header and press it into place. You can now route your 8 pin cable over like this to plug it in, or alternatively, you can unscrew the top two motherboard screws, pull the 8 pin to the back of the case, then push it up behind the motherboard like this. Either way you route it, take it and just like the 24 pin line the clip and the bump out up and press it into place. Now bring your attention to the front panel I.O. headers down here in the corner. Start by taking the one that says power switch and plug it into these two pins here. Orientation doesn't matter. Now take the power LED connectors and plug them in with the positive facing to the left away from the power switch. Next take the reset switch and plug it in directly below the power switch. And finally take the hard drive LED and plug it in directly to the left of the reset switch again with the positive facing the left. It's now time to install our graphics card. Start by opening up the PCIe lock like this. Grab your card and line the cutout in the card with the notch in the PCIe slot. Once lined up, lower it down and press it into place making sure the PCIe lock snaps shut. You can now reinstall the top PCIe screw like this. Then take the cover, push it back on and secure it down with the screw you removed earlier. 
Now take the PCIe power cable and just like with the 8 and 24 pin ones, line it up and press it into place. With that done, everything's installed and connected, but there's still a few more things to do before you can boot it up. We need to now cable manage. Start by pulling any excess cable link to the back of the case. Try and organize the cables with the included zip ties, trying to make everything as flat as possible. The biggest thing is making sure everything looks nice in the front chamber because that's what everyone sees. You can now set the case face down like this to install the back panel. Again, make sure everything is as flat as possible, then lower down the cover and slide it into place, and reinstall the two back thumb screws. Now flip the case the other way around, do one last cable management check, lower on the glass panel, and reinstall the four thumb screws. With that done, you're now ready to boot your system up for the first time, but there's still a number of things we have to do before you can start gaming. The first thing is to install Windows, which I will show you how to do right now. To do this, you'll need another PC and a USB flash drive that's wiped and has at least 8GB of capacity. Go to the Microsoft page linked in the description and download the Windows Media Creation Tool. Open this up, let it run until you get to this screen. Accept the agreement, then it'll bring you to what do you want to do window and just select create installation media and hit next. Now you'll select some language and version options, make sure you select your language of choice, Windows 10 and 64 bit, then press next. Now under choose which media to use, select USB flash drive and hit next. Now select your flash drive which all data will be erased from so make sure it doesn't have anything important on it. Once selected hit next, it will now download the Windows 10 files to the flash drive. Once this is done you can hit finish and eject the flash drive. Next take it to your new PC and plug it into one of the USB 3 ports on the back. Turn on your PC and it should automatically have the spinning wheel at the bottom and boot to this screen. Next hit the install window, it will then ask you for a Windows key. If you have one from CDK Deals, you can put it in now or you can do it later by selecting I don't have a product key. Once this is done, you can accept the agreement and hit next. If you don't have a product key, you will then be asked to select your version, which I recommend Windows 10. Now select custom install windows, now select drive zero and hit next. It will now go through and install windows. When that's done, it will bring you to this page where you'll go through the prompts and set up your account and select whatever you want from these options. After that, it will do some more installations and then bring you into Windows. So Windows is successfully installed, but we need to do one more thing before you can start gaming, and that is to install the graphics drivers. Head to the graphics drivers linked in the description, select graphics, 400 series, 400 series again, RX480 then hit submit and download the Windows 10 64-bit drivers. Once downloaded, open these up, hit install, which will eventually bring you to another installation window. Again, hit install, let it do its thing, then once done you can restart your computer. With that completed, everything is done and you are now ready to download some games and enjoy your new system. Speaking of playing games, it's now time to show you how the system performs in a bunch of games and in streaming. I test a bunch of popular games, but if I missed one you think I should test, let me know and I may use that game for future builds. First up is Fortnite, which I test at 1080p Pro Settings, which is basically epic view distance and everything else set to low. With these settings, the system was able to put out a 180 FPS average, which is nice to see it's able to output above 144 FPS. Moving on to Apex Legends, I test at 1080p with what I would consider medium settings. Doing this resulted in an overall average of 85 FPS, which was a very smooth an enjoyable experience. With that being said, you could probably get 100 plus FPS by putting the settings to low, but I think medium settings offers the best middle ground between looks and performance. Next up is COD Warzone, which I also tested at 1080p medium. Doing this resulted in an overall 80 FPS average, which was smooth and enjoyable. There were some dips, but I very rarely saw the FPS drop below 60. Moving on to Borderlands 3, which is a very intensive AAA title, I tested using the built-in benchmark at 1080p medium settings. Doing this resulted in a 73 FPS average, which is proof that 60 FPS AAA gaming is very much possible on this PC. Moving on to CSGO, I test this game at 1080p Pro Settings in a Team Deathmatch match. Doing this resulted in the FPS staying in the mid 200s most of the time. This was a very smooth experience and should be fine for competitive play. Next up is Doom Eternal, which disappointingly only averaged a little over 60 FPS, meaning it was frequently sitting below the 60 FPS mark. This was at 1080p high settings and the game was definitely playable, but some of you may not call it an enjoyable experience. Finally, I tested Rainbow Six at 1080p very high using the built-in benchmark. Doing this resulted in a 203 FPS average, which again is good to see that it's well above the 144 FPS mark. 
With gaming benchmarks out of the way, let's talk about streaming. I test this PC streaming Fortnite and Warzone to Twitch with a 1080p 60fps stream. Both games ran fine with Warzone staying over 60fps pretty much the entire time and Fortnite staying above 120fps the vast majority of the time. This shows that this system is really good for streaming games like Fortnite and Warzone. All in all, for $600, the system looks and performs great. The PC hardware market is in a strange place right now, but I think this shows that building a budget build is very much possible in 2021. I hope you guys found this guide helpful or entertaining. These build guides are a lot of work, but if you guys keep watching them, then I'll keep making them. Again, thanks to CDK Deals for sponsoring this video. Go ahead and pick up a cheap Windows 10 key using the link in the description if you want to support the channel. So yeah guys, I think this wraps this video up. I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, make sure to give this video a thumbs up and consider subscribing. And as always, this is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.